our uh, first panel of the day. I would like to introduce uh, our chair first, Stuart Laws of uh, Ministry of Defence uh, here in the UK. And uh, the subject of the panel is United We Reach for the Stars. Yep. Stage is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. On the stage today, we've got Mark and Martin. We've also got online Aravind and uh, Mani. So we're going to try and do a hybrid thing for you today. Uh, so I'm Stuart Laws. I work for the Ministry of Defence in the Defence Innovation Unit. Part of my responsibilities and why I'm here today is it's my job to work out how defence delivers cross-sector innovation challenges to solve defence capability challenges and then to enable that capability to become live capability which we're able to use on a day-to-day -day basis. The interesting bit about that is I'm not only interested in what defence capability is, I'm also interested in what the cross-sector aspect is. So where does civil sector benefit from the same things and the same problems that defence has? So as I've already said, so we've got Mark and Martin on stage with me. Uh, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, good, good morning. Mark Burrows. Um, I'm based at a place called Harwell, uh, which is about 16 miles south of Oxford. Um, it's a, a centre of space excellence, is the best way to describe it, in as much as we've got government science going on there, which is jolly good at building bits to go on satellites. It's got a satellite test facility, uh, and my area of expertise is probably growing small, medium enterprises into something that's going to survive. Um, so we have a number of business incubation activities that we run, uh, and the aim is very much to sort of grow and develop and push them forward so that they survive in the future. Um, so I've been there for about seven or eight years. Prior to that, I was in the defence sector, um, basically uh, on, the, on what I call the downstream side of life, analysing data and, and getting it out, making some use of it. And again, with a cross-fertilisation into, into the civilian market as well. Allied with you, we have on our site an organisation called the Defence and Security Accelerator, which is a source of funding, uh, which again helps small and medium enterprises grow. So that's the Harwell campus and me in a nutshell. I'm, go I'm going, going to switch to, to those that are remote now. So we start with Aravind, if you'd like to a quick introduction. Uh, and in true hybrid style, you're on mute, Aravind. <laughs> Still can't hear you. Should we try Manny? Hello, can you hear me? Can hear you well, I can clear Manny. You can hear me, great. Um, hi everyone, Manny Shah. I'm the head of analytics at Bryce, uh, Bryce Tech. We're in an analytics and engineering consult consultancy and have been supporting um, uh, government and commercial clients on a range of topics, including uh, uh, what, what it means to be, uh, for government to be an innovative uh, uh, kind of procurer of capabilities from, from companies, um, and, and, you know, as well as a range of topics around uh, technology road mapping, uh, market analysis, etc. Uh, prior to that, I was at uh, Inmarsat, a satellite communications company based in London. And uh, before that, I was in the uh, fi financial industry. Cool. Thank you. Should we try again, Aravind? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Can hear you loud and clear. Brilliant. Uh, so my name is Aravind. I work for a company called Tomorrow, Tomorrow.io. Uh, we are a weather intelligence company based in the US. Um, I'm based in France. Um, we are sending a constellation of weather radar satellites uh, up starting next year. Uh, for our weather intelligence platform that's being used um, by clients around the world to get weather insights um, um, around the world. I used to work in the space industry. I used to work in software for the first five years of my career. And the last five years, I've been in the space industry um, as a strategy consultant. And now with tomorrow, I'm the director of strategy for space. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and then we have Martin on stage with us as well. Hi. <coughs> Hi. Um, I, I have a rather unusual background. Uh, over the last 25 years, I've developed myself into someone who builds global companies as chairman, CEO, or director. I take companies public, I scale them globally, and when things go wrong, I jump in to sort out the problems. In, in the context of space, I'm on the uh, corporate advisory board of Seraphim Space. The world, it was actually, we were actually the, first, the world's first space technology fund, and recently we transitioned into an investment trust and gone public on the London Stock Exchange. Uh, we invest in companies in, in Europe and North America, 
uh, and I'm also involved with the, uh, our accelerator program, uh, mentoring entrepreneurs on that. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a bit of a conversation mostly around uh, the benefits to the civil sector, the, the benefits of collaboration, some of the challenges, um, a bit around defence, uh, unsurprisingly, with me being in the chair, um, uh, and then we'll, we'll look at some questions as well. So please do think of some questions uh, as we're talking. So I'm going to start off with the uh, relevance of space to everyday life and how civil sector has utilized the opportunities in space uh, in order to, to improve our daily lives, as it were. Who'd like to kick off? I, I can start initially. Um, so one of the questions I always ask when a new company comes along uh, and uh, they're a space company, I say, that's fine. Um, so I said, right, what's your market? How are you going to make life better for the rest of the community? Uh, you know, how, how, who, where's the problem? What's the itch that needs to be scratched? And how are you going to outperform uh, some of your competitors, whatever your competitors might be. So it, often we find that there's a, you know, lots of people have got some interesting algorithms that can do something very special with hyperspectral, and, uh, hyperspectral data, for example. That's fine, but actually what I always think is you've got to find the market first. Find, the, fi fi find out where the problem is and then work your way backwards and then see if you've still got a solution. So do the market research, which sounds very non-scientific, um, and I'm a great believer, and actually, you know, STEM is great, but you've got to include something else in that STEM business, and that's that business of market research and PR and advertising as well. Um, so <clears throat> there's a lot, the, the, the lot of problems out there that need, that where space can come, come out, it be they on the timings, you know, it's getting timing sorted out, be it on the uh, navigation side of life, uh, be it on the analytic side of life, and I'll use an example, we've had a company that's recently arrived, um, they, about six people, uh, and they're working for the county council and doing some land analysis, land use analysis, uh, and so it's for Oxfordshire County Council and they're spinning out into Buckinghamshire as well. So that's great, they're growing, and they're just basically doing um, change detection on, on land use, uh, very niche area, but they've discovered there's a market for it, and they've gone for it. And that's an example of how uh, a bit of space uh, technology, for want of a better word, downstream space technology, has come into use, uh, and they can actually make some money out of it, and actually it makes life better for Oxfordshire County Council and potentially Berkshire and Buckinghamshire County Councils as well. So that was just an example. But as I always suggest, you know, the first thing I always say is, you know, find where the market is first, uh, you know, find out who's got a problem, and then work backwards. Okay. What do you think, Martin? Well, uh, I'd like to refer to what probably is the biggest problem uh, facing us at the moment, and that is climate change. Uh, we're talking about government and, and the public and the private sector. Well, governments are committing themselves to targets for climate change alleviation. Now, that data will only come from Earth observation satellites, looking at what's happening in agriculture, in our urban environments, in terms of heat uh, dissipation, um, so I, I think space is a crucial part of that. And let's not forget, it was actually NASA in 1987 that identified the ozone hole in our atmosphere, which is, is uh, so it started the process. So space is essential in, in on the ground problems that face us today. Thank you. Uh, Aravind. Sure, um, on, on our end, you know, weather is again, one of the areas of space that well, often it's kind of underreported or, uh, you know, underrated really, because, um, you know, it, it really doesn't, you know, sometimes it fits into Earth observation, sometimes it doesn't, but it's, it's been rather right in the realm of only the public sector with, with NOAA and UMITSAT and, you know, the UK Med Office kind of being at the, at the realm of innovation, technological advancement, and, you know, what we get with our weather forecasts on a daily basis. Um, but obviously, you know, in the, you know, we were talking about climate change and, you know, one aspect of climate change is uh, the climate mitigation and, you know, how we can go ahead and reduce our emissions and how we can use satellites to monitor them. And then the other aspect of climate is the adaptation and, you know, extreme weather events are happening on almost a daily basis now, unfortunately, and you need uh, weather insights to, to let not only individuals, but also businesses and governments prepare for that. So, again, space is is playing a huge role in that and what we aim to do is also to improve the forecast accuracy and you know what we provide is again weather intelligence which is different from forecasting because forecasting is just data where you know you just supply the data of there's going to be flash floods for the next couple of hours you know that's not actionable and intelligence is you know one step ahead of 
um, you know, what you actually need to do and how you can actually prepare. Uh, and given the climate that we're living in, um, you know, that's, that's kind of one of the most important benefits of space that uh, we can think of today. Thank you. Uh, and money. Yeah, it's always tricky to uh, come, in, come in at the end uh, when all the good answers have been uh, provided, but I'll, I'll have a go. Um, I think one, one key aspect that um, I suppose doesn't get uh, brought to the forefront is when it comes to disasters, um, one of the critical uh, capabilities that, that is needed and is not available is, is connectivity. So, um, you know, satellite communications play a really important role in, in kind of being that first um, uh, capability that they, they need to have on the ground to be able to uh, get the right resources in, uh, make sure everyone's able to uh, have, connect to their families and, and all, all the important things that happen, uh, particularly when uh, disaster strikes. So, um, you know, on top of what's been said so far, uh, that, that's an area that, you know, it's, it's very important when it comes to what space has to offer to the public and um, you know knock on wood it doesn't happen too often but but uh, but it is also still very important so it's almost like we set it up so Manny's covered a point which is a particular problem for defense so when we move into a new operational area there is generally no communications infrastructure there's very little there supply routes and all this it all comes with us when we move into an operational theater so immediately you can see there's a shared challenge there around where we might collaborate with the civil sector. Now, there are benefits and there are challenges from there. Um, so I'm going to start with Manu this time, because you went last last time. So, so what would you say the key benefits and challenges are between private and public sector collaboration? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good, uh, good point. And, um, you know, so, some of the... I'll start with the challenges. Um, <laughs> when it comes to... Um, one key aspect is around uh, risk tolerance. So in the private sector, um, you're working around increased risk tolerance, particularly when it comes to venture, venture kind of uh, venture backed organizations. There's a sense of, you know, some of these organizations will fail. So we'll, we'll kind of um, uh, back a number of these organizations with the expectations, expectation that uh, one or two will uh, provide outsized returns. So um, that kind of risk tolerance mindset that it doesn't necessarily um, it's not necessarily embedded in in kind of the public uh, public side given you know the uh, fallbacks that might occur if if uh, if, if uh, things don't go the right way so um, there's that there's that fight kind of um, threading the needle in that aspect of how how you work together when there's a mismatch of um, alignment on risk risk tolerance for example but also um, the pace of that, that kind of collaboration and, and ability to work together. Um, private sector is generally known to be um, more, a uh, bit faster when it comes to uh, innovating and, and uh, getting things done, which, you know, with public sector, that's a challenge when you have many uh, stakeholders involved. Um, there's a, a, a need to, uh, an important need to get things right the first time and rather than um, being able to um, take take a, a lot of risk and, and again a lot of it does go back to the risk issue of what 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 is um, acceptable so yeah the, 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 some of the challenges are around I think the, the risk um, and when it comes to the benefits obviously there is the um, backing the reputation that you get when you have a government backing your your idea or your capability, and, and that can lead to potentially increased um, uh, more customers internationally or, or, or from uh, in terms of governments as well as commercial, because when they see a, your government is supporting you in that in initiative or endeavor or capability, then then that's kind of saying, um, you know, if your government's backing that, then, then that's quite respectful. Yep. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. Martin. Yeah, I'd just like to broaden it slightly because many of the factors that you mentioned as being relevant to the defense sector yep. are also relevant to disaster relief. Yep. Uh, in addition, you know, navies are often used to protect the commercial shipping lanes. Mm -hmm. so, so the overlap is already very, very close. So it's, yep. uh, and I think uh, you know, 
the private sector is involved in both of those. So I think it's going to be very relevant in trying to find solutions. And private companies tend to be more flexible in trying new things more rapidly. And even within your supply chain, I mean, you have a whole range of private companies providing services into the defense sector. Yep. So I think the same will happen with space as well. Okay. Cool. Mark. Um, I think um, private versus public. Um, I, I was a product, to a certain extent, of the Thatcher era, if that makes sense. That's sort of the early 70s, when the maxim went out, public sector's bad, private sector's good. Uh, and as I've grown older, I've realized they are both fruit. One's an apple, the other's an orange. They're different, uh, but actually they both bring something to the party. Uh, there are some things that the public sector is really good at, and there are some things the private sector is really good at. Uh, and sometimes a combination of the two actually is, is synergistic. You get the best of both. Um, so some things the public sector is really good at, for example, is providing a framework. We've got a new UK space agency uh, doctrine, for want of a better word, a new framework, a document that's come out. Uh, there's uh, a, certainly a lot of what I call capital investment uh, in uh, some of the space industry, the downstream space industry and the upstream. Um, so there's a huge amount of capital investment that's been made, which can be used by the private sector uh, on a sort of pay-as-you-go basis or something. Saves small companies putting up capital up front, which is always difficult. Um, so there are certain facilities uh, that actually are available for uh, organizations to use and abuse, uh, which, which can be uh, you know, uh, sought uh, and used by the, by the private sector. So um, I, th I think that, yeah, I th that think synergistically about the whole thing. Um, you know, there are times when it's really good to use parts of the public sector. Public sector can always help. Public sector, I mean, my KPIs are driven, key performance indicators are very much driven by how successful small and medium enterprises are and how we can help them grow. So uh, we, yeah, I think we're on the same side. It used to be a, a controversial process of public sector versus private sector, but actually it's come right close together now, uh, and, and uh, I think it was alluded to before. We both need each other, um, and uh, it's, it's, um, it, we've just got to try and find that sweet spot in the middle, which is beneficial for both parties. Cool. Thank you. Arvind, do you want to add anything? Sure, I think there's been a lot of interesting points mentioned and, you know, I've, uh, in my previous job, I used to work uh, a lot with the European Space Agency and I see that, you know, the, the change in mentality and, the, you know, the change in mindset as well in terms of how they are approaching uh, innovation and um, how they are supporting um, different types of companies across domains, you know, from, from the Lunar Initiative and, in, you know, in terms of them being the anchor customer, which was recently signed uh, or, you know, the lunar uh, communication system uh, to, you know, how they're approaching uh, Earth observation missions and adopting the use of Earth observation data. You know, recently, um, ISI, which is a startup, became a contributing mission to, to the Copernicus program. You know, that's Copernicus program, you know, if you've seen seven years ago, it was only a public initiative and, you know, it had only Sentinel missions and, um, you know, a couple of other contributing ESA missions. But now you have a couple of uh, private companies contributing to that and, and you know that's just one example in the earth observation sector of how uh, the the you know the mindset has shifted from you know just looking at uh, you know the use of earth observation data created by public agencies to now you know a, a collaboration between the two and i think that applies to all the sectors as well um, including weather um, as as we come in from the weather perspective and it's been the case for launch, um, especially in the US, uh, what we've seen in space, and I'm sure that's going to happen in, the Euro, in, in Europe as well going forward. Cool. Thank you. And I guess from, from a defence perspective, there was a time when if you were asked what defence did, you'd probably only focus on the military side, I think. I think the last 18 months or so, there's been a clear indication that defence is there for more than just military operations. There's been a lot of military aid to civil authorities supporting the government both here in the UK and overseas. There's a lot of the humanitarian stuff that defence gets involved with as well. There's patrolling, you know, um, export licences, so making sure UK interests both are protected from an intellectual point but also from the vulnerability point of view. So there's a lot of crossovers there with it. But there's still in some areas a perception that defence is a bad input and a bad influence on investments and companies. So what does a panel think around the importance or influence of defense being visible as an investor and a capability driver in the space industry? I'll start with Martin this time. 
I think it depends on which countries you're looking at. Um, you know, if you look at America, certain defense industries are actually investors in venture capital and they actually invest in some of the, the underlying technologies. Um, I think one of the difficulties of any startup as they're growing is having stable customer base. And I think that's just something that the defense industries and, and the government sector more generally provides for many of the startups who are trying to get scale, they're trying to uh, establish their solutions as being relevant to customers. So I think you know, defense, governments generally are very important in that context. Uh, I think the other thing also is we've been talking very much in terms of geographical blocks. So the first speaker was talking very much about America and, and China. You know, Europe itself also has a very strong space sector uh, uh, and through ESA, uh, UK is very actively involved as well as having an independent capability. But even outside that, governments are getting involved in, in, in commercial applications. So. Uh, I think recently the Japanese Space Agency, the Brazilians and the United Arab Emirates came together to collaborate for space applications. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to see a much more of diffusion and I think governments have a very key role to play in helping build you know, the, uh, the markets for the private companies. Cool. Okay. I'm going to move over to Arvin now. Sure. Um, I think um, you know there was there were a couple of interesting points raised about you know how the collaboration has been you know increasing and you know there's a move away from what's only going on on the defense side. But I believe that the defense is always not always, but in most sectors it's usually the anchor customer. Um, and anchor customer, I think it's it's an interesting kind of uh, thing that exists in the space industry, which you know I've not noticed in. Other industries is that uh, the defense is the defense sector usually steps in and is the first in terms of adopting a new innovation. It can be the, the you know the new launch vehicle um, from from SpaceX or the reusable reusability that they that they showed. You know they they adopt that. Or if it's in our situation, you know again they adopt that. And in our case as well, we have we signed a recent contract with the U.S. Air Force, and you know this was the first. Uh, commercial weather satellite constellation, what we're launching. And again, you know, the defense sector happens to be uh, the anchor customer or one of our first anchor customers for, for our weather constellation. So across the board, I think the importance of defense is, is pretty underlined. You know, it's, 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 it's one of the most inevitable parts of the space industry is the, the overlap and the dependency on defense is, is probably going to be there as much as the collaboration with, you know, the civil sector is, is, is improving and increasing um, every day. Cool. Thank you. Um, Mani? Yeah, thanks. Uh, great answers there uh, so far. Um, uh, it got, you know, defense as a customer, um, you know, it's very sophisticated in, in the needs that, that it has. And um, particularly when it comes to very new innovative, innovative technology, um, it can be quite challenging to uh, buy into some of that without really, really deeply understanding what's going on. So um, I think it's interesting to maybe pull some lessons from the US and what, what they're doing with some of their uh, programs um, uh, like, like Blackjack and others that they're using to uh, procure capabilities from multiple providers that is at the leading edge of, of uh, innovation, um, of, uh, whether that's on uh, optical inter-satellite links, um, whether that's uh, you know pro proliferated LEO uh, technologies, um, there's, there's a lot of interesting innovation happening, but but it requires that deep understanding, but also kind of stepping back and really knowing what the defense customer really wants as well, um, what what the end goal is. So um, I think that there's a, a bit of, yeah, make sure you understand what the need is and, and, and what the capability is to, to, to be able to meet that. So um, that, that's, yeah. Okay, thank you. And Mark. So all I'd say is that the, uh, the space uh, community, uh, the commercial space community and the defense community are getting closer together. Um, so the new uh, space uh, policy document that's come out recently uh, has indicated that uh, our, my government department that works that I work for, Business Energy Industrial Strategy and the MOD will get close together, collaborate, cooperate and communicate with each other uh, together uh, to help develop some of the space uh, capabilities for the future. Now that has raised a couple of interesting questions. I was at a meeting yesterday 
And a couple of our, shall we say, more mature science people almost held up yellow cards and said, I don't want to work with the um, defense community because they kill people. And I think the point you alluded to earlier, actually, you know, defense isn't about killing people. Uh, it's much more about uh, shaving people from countries like uh, Afghanistan, for example, flying them out. It's you know, helping with floods. It's helping with famine and a whole load of other things uh, and nation building. So there's a whole raft of other activities. It is not about targeting and killing people, which and defense does have or did have that reputation, shall we say. And I think there's a, a continual sort of need to push out this view that actually defense is actually for our own security uh, and coupled with this you know, organization called the Defense and Security Accelerator. It's actually it's and security, personal security, national security. So I think there's a, there's a messaging uh, point to get across there uh, that actually some people don't necessarily like working in defense uh, and that's for historical reasons. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a lot of interesting points there uh, which we've, we've sort of covered off and there are a lot of complexities obviously with, with the civil sector uh, we've looked at the, the rapid pace, the innovation being brought in and then safe pair of hands almost from public sector uh, and defense and that long-term commitment. And one of the things that I'm working on at the moment is an emerging challenge. Uh, that means I have to understand the 10 years worth of programmed activity that UK Space Command have said, this is what they're going to do with the money they've got from the defense budget. Which means if I come along with a new shiny thing, it might not actually become capability. Because if we can't figure out where it fits into that 10 year of programmed activity, there isn't any new money for it. So I might find the best thing ever but then it might not go anywhere. And that's part of the challenges that we've got within defense is understanding what industry is able to provide for us, how quickly it might respond. But more importantly, the challenge for us is how do we indicate when we might need something new as we go forward? And I think that's probably the one challenge we haven't really spoken around. And that comes into funding and venture capitalism and all those sort of things. So how do we think we, we best indicate where that future interest might be. And then I'm going to open the floor to questions elsewhere. Right. Yeah, I think uh, like a number of government organizations, we have this what I call annuality issue. Uh, we have to spend the money by a certain, in certain years. Uh, you have to spend it in that year or that year or that year because it's not real money. It's either money that the government's going to borrow or money that is going to be raised uh, from taxes. So it's, it's not real money until it's given out to somebody. Uh, yeah, we don't have a bank account, so to speak. That's why we have this sort of really sort of tight controls over when money can become available. Um, also, um, from a, uh, yeah, we, 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 we can push funding out. We, 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 we can run proof of concept type programs and projects. Uh, we can uh, have a, a business incubation program sponsored through ESA, so the money goes from the government uh, through UK Space Agency to ESA, then back to small medium enterprises. Uh, again, all has to be spent in certain years at certain times. Um, the difference is, of course, you know, with a small medium enterprise or a, or a, or a bigger organization, um, you, know, you, don't, you have a bank account and money can get carried across from one year to the next more easily. Uh, so there is that sort of um, yeah, need to understand that sort of dilemma of how finances operate within the government versus the private sector. Um, again, the answer is communicate, understand, uh, and think ahead. So often we come across, you know, we have issues towards the end of our financial year, which is along the lines of we've got some money to get rid of, for want of a better word, which sounds really mad. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, there's an opportunity here for a small medium enterprise to say, oh, I've exactly got, I've got a project or a proof of concept. I need to get my idea from techn technology readiness level four or five up to six or seven. Uh, and if you give me X amount of money, I can do that and then I can probably take it on to another step further. So sometimes there is that sort of link into the government organizations uh, where potentially we could help. Okay, thank you. Martin? I think budgets are one thing, but I think also governments have a very uh, regulatory role because in terms of communication satellites and the uh, home mobile networks and related, you know, governments sort of, uh, they license bandwidth, you know, they, they license who can actually operate in those. So I think it's very important to understand how to fit within those. Uh, I think another area where governments are probably very important, which we haven't really covered, and is probably not directly relevant to some of the issues here, and that is the uh, legal framework, because there are some space treaties, but on the whole, space law does not really exist in, in the detail that will be ne necessary to take things forward. So I think companies sometimes will find it difficult to know what they can and can't do because of the regulatory framework and also the legal framework of what is 
uh, to protect their own rights. So there's, there's still a lot to, that's evolving. Space is really an evolving sector. It's an emerging market, so it, it's still a lot still to be determined. Yep. Thank you. And Arvin? Sure. I think what I can add is um, building on what um, was mentioned before. It is something that governments are still trying to figure out simply because, you know, even, you know, even if you were to assume that the U.S. is the most advanced, you know, space nation today, even they are still, you know, um, figuring things out as, as we go, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of how they look at the launch contract, you know, the way they're looking at how to, you know, how to approve um, the environmental assessment for, for, for Starship, which is an ongoing thing. Um, I think yesterday there was the hearing with the public. Uh, so, you know, it's something that the government is trying to figure out um, almost on a daily basis, uh, operationally speaking, and also strategically, um, you know, as, uh, as, as, as the question was posed about you know, how do you plan for, for 10 years? You know, it's, it's also about, you know, preparing those roadmaps and, you know, trying to understand what technology can evolve and then try to see what level of funding you can um, assign for that because you also need to take into account what's going on in the space industry. I think that was mentioned in the, in the first session about the amount of venture capital flowing into the industry. You know, by the time um, the government or, you know, the, the defense is ready to fund something, you know, the, the VCs would have probably already funded it and you know gotten the technology to a trl that is good enough for for commercial adoption so you know that's also a challenge for for governments and and the defense to, to figure out because they that's why you know they shouldn't act in silos and it's better off if they you know work, work together with uh, with the private sector and especially with the vcs in terms of how they approach things okay thank you and any last thoughts money before we open up for questions from the floor yeah, I think I'll uh, uh, go to pull on what Ar Arvind was saying. There can be um, some interesting alignment done at that early stage uh, with, with um, some of the innovation that's happening. Um, a good model for this is uh, in the US with InQtel, where they find and invest in companies that are working on some interesting innovations um, while also making purchases in the kind of low million, one to two million as one of their first customers. So it's kind of having a multifold effect in that they're providing that risk capital, but also giving that confidence to the company that you know, they have a customer in for, for their capability. And then also that's engaging that company and, and helping to align and influence it in the way that is needed for whatever requirements the, uh, uh, the, that customer might have. So um, I think that's an interesting approach that's uh, worked quite well as well. Cool, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to open the floor up to questions now. We we'll go to the front first. strategy that's not there or what would you like to see clarified to nudge either the private sector or the public sector to, to come up to this to rise to this challenge um, if I may second question is defense and government spending the way we should marry the quite large negative NPV and small launch that we saw in the last presentation with the UK's decision to specialize in small launch good questions who would like to pick up the first one yeah. <laughs> I, I, for, for want of a better, I, I think it is you know, a way. I don't know whether it's the right way. It's a way. Um, we, we're working on a, on a sort of directive, a directive is too strong a word, a plan where, we, where the UK uh, hopes to uh, win about 10% of the global market. Uh, a decision was made uh, some years ago along those lines um, because it was thought to be achievable in looking at what was around then. Uh, it was thought that the UK needed to have a high-tech economy and space was part of that um, and uh, and then we th it was also thought that we would then be competitive with the rest of the world uh, we were in a unique position we were not quite so big and and should we say muscular as some of the American companies but we would have to compete with China and Russia and India and other space organizations space countries um, so how would we do that and the answer was 
space was one of them. Pharmaceuticals is another one, for example. So there, there are plenty of other sort of high-tech areas uh, where it is thought the UK could be competitive. Um, so how is it going to work? Um, government pump priming, pump priming might be the answer. It has worked in the past, uh, and therefore, yeah, that should be encouraged, perhaps. Um, I think cross uh, government department cooperation and collaboration I think is key there's no point in for example you know business energy industrial strategy going off in that direction MOD going that way and DEFRA going that way for example I mean it's great if they all come together uh, we do work with the other government departments DIT for example is another one uh, international trade um, is does it is it working well it's it's working uh, I think uh, it could do better. I think, you know, CDB, like it said on my school reports many years ago, always could do better. Uh, and it's this business of communicating and collaborating, you know, get the, getting that right message out in the right sort of time in the right place. Uh, and I think eventually it will happen. Early indications are that so far so good. I think we're on a sort of the right sort of glide path. Uh, but I think we've got to do a bit better before we you know, achieve our targets. Yep. Can, can I take a slightly different approach? Of course. I, I, I used to be involved with government where government said you can't pick winners. I don't believe in a single strategy. Uh, I think what's important is, you know, the government has one strategy which meets their targets. The European Space Agency, of which the UK government contribute 40% of the budget, have a different approach, and they're trying to bring up a whole range of new startups and, and companies, many of which are based in, in Harwell. Um, and I think uh, venture capital also is looking for solutions of, of, of where are the markets that could actually make money. So I think you've got a number of different uh, directions going ahead, and I think that's a good thing. I, I don't think anybody can necessarily predict in 10 years' time where the winners will be, who will be the successful companies or the sectors or what we need or what we don't need. Mm -hmm. So I think actually that's a positive, the fact that we have this diversity of approaches. And I, and I think it's, it's, it's sort of the, the views to innovation. We get challenged quite a lot of the, are you going to put all your money into one or two big projects and significant game change uh, innovations, or are you going to do the thousand flowers brewing approach? I think, you know, personally, my view is we should find a comfort ground between the two. A couple of really big projects, but then on the whole, we don't really know where things are going to come from. So that collaboration, yeah. is, which was mentioned, I think is key. We need to at least be in a vague direction together rather than trying to go in different directions and find different things. Um, and I think that, for me, that's what the strategy really needs to bring out, is, the, is that collaboration approach. Uh, there were some other questions. So the next questions we're going to throw at Arvin and Manny, I think, just to give them a bit of warning. Thanks to all the panellists for the interesting discussion. Uh, so the question returning to the theme of public and private collaboration, uh, there's a perception that in the UK and Europe we're much slower with incubators and accelerators uh, and, and companies, frankly, stay too long. Uh, I, I wondered, I suppose it's a question mostly for uh, Mark and or Martin, uh, whether you think that's right, and if so, how so can we strike the right balance between providing com early stage companies the support they need and getting them to stand on their own two feet without pulling away the life support too prematurely, uh, but also avoiding the problem of grant entrepreneurs, as I know. So we're going to do a quick answer to that one, because I think we're being waved out to get off the stage as well for the next speaker. So would you like to go first, Martin? Yeah, I, th I think, first of all, there are a number of uh, incubation and acceleration programs, both run by uh, Seraphim Space. We have our accelerator at Harwell. There's a very active and very successful incubator but your point was about what stage should those companies move out and I think you know as venture capital moves in and starts looking and uh, is searching for companies that are going to be the next successes that have a commercial uh, deployment that is that customers will want I, I think uh, that w that is beginning to happen uh, the, the first speaker earlier today was saying there's too much money going into the space uh, so I think those companies are being accelerated uh, and are getting uh, funding. Uh, the question is whether or not too many of them are getting funding, but that's something for the future to determine. Cool. Thank you. Anything? Uh, yeah, all I'd say is we, 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 we not, as, as was alluded to, you know, we run a number of incubation programs and acceleration programs. Um, ballpark, I mean, from, from, from if, a, if somebody came to me with, a, say, a two or three person company, uh, I would reckon they, we would have to have them for about five to seven years as a rule. Uh, and then they're into sort of Series A and Series B funding after that. So we do try and G them along. 
as, as gently as we possibly can. All I say is that we try to create an environment where success can occur uh, without actually being, you know, getting a, a sort of a right boot behind them and telling them to get a move on. Uh, that's sometimes difficult because we don't want to interfere with the way they do business. Uh, and again, it much depends on, on, on how we can how we can encourage them to grow. You know, we, do, if in, in, we have introductions, we have access to funding events, we have networking events and so forth. Uh, but the, the general sort of rule of thumb is it's about five to seven years. Um, and I don't know how to speed that up, to be honest. Uh, it'd be quite interesting. We have had a, a few cases which have gone, we had one company uh, who was here actually a couple of years ago, Open Cosmos, that went from three to 50 in about four years. Um, they've since come down a bit, but they have, you know, one or two can speed up quite quickly. Uh, and they were launching small satellites. They provided the full service of launching and providing the package, complete package. So um, how do we do it quicker, better, faster? I'm, I'm open to suggestions, uh, I think, but ball, ballpark figure, it's about five to seven years for each small, medium enterprise. What you may get is a certain roll-up strategy of, of consolidation, of acquisitions. We do. We have had a few mergers and acquisitions. Some have been friendly, some have been less than friendly. Uh, uh, but it, they have proved to be uh, helpful from a business point of view. Pretty nasty from CEOs of certain companies. They've had to be sort of hoofed out in the not so nice possible way, but there we go. But uh, yeah, we have had mergers and acquisitions and they have helped um, uh, to get the company growing and actually make the company more viable for the future. Cool. So thank you, panel members. Um, I think we've had a good conversation uh, and sort of laid the ground in that uh, collaboration is the way to go. There are some clear benefits, but there are some challenges and we waved at. Sorry, That's okay. the, the space sector has seen rapid change in the last five years. Do the panelists see that the next five years will bring the same rate of change in the industry? It's a good one. I think from a defence point of view, we'd like it to be fairly steady because that allows us to understand and manage the risks. Yeah. Uh, probably not the case for everybody else on the panel. I'm going to give Manny and Arvin a chance to answer this one. Go with Manny uh -huh. first. Sure, yeah, um, a good question. Um, you know, the, the previous speaker uh, talked about the private investment that's flowing in, and we've been tracking uh, private investment since the year 2000, and really the last five years have been quite transformational. Um, and with the SPACs coming into the picture and, and, and really growing that investment raised uh, even more, um, I think what we might see a bit more of uh, in the next five years is, is a bit of that consolidation M&A activity um, uh, taking taking hold, a bit more hold. So I think that will be interesting to see how that shapes the, the sector. Um, th there's a lot of small startups, a lot of uh, growing kind of scale ups as well. So where that leads will, will be interesting to see. Cool. Aravind? Yeah, I perfectly agree with what Manny was saying about the consolidation. You know, we already saw signs of it. Um, of the recently SPAC companies, Pi or Rocket Lab, already starting to make acquisitions. So I'm sure that's going to become the norm, but I think the um, the challenge is in the next five years, how are we going to balance that? Because you know that's uh, you know that's the stabilization side where you know you you know you invest and invest, and then you know there needs to be some kind of commercialization and stabilization. And you know how do we balance that out with uh, the need for investing in newer technologies and continuing the innovation? You know, will VCs stop funding after a point? as they see the market consolidating, or will they go ahead and keep, you know, supporting newer innovations? And how do we balance that out? I think that would be the interesting trend to watch in the next five years. Cool, thank you. So I think we're probably out of time now. Um, Martin, Mark, and myself uh, are here, so please do feel free to, to catch us um, uh, and have a chat. You might be able to get in touch with Manny and Arvin through uh, the remote part of the, of the day and pass questions on to them as well. Um, but thank you for, for listening, uh, and we look forward to talking to you uh, as the day progresses. And thanks for chairing the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.